So you have a business idea that you want to raise capital for, right? Or you want to buy your first business or whatever the case is. A lot of people need to raise capital. But sorry to tell you, the banks and investors aren't just dishing out money like they used to. They're actually holding those checks very, very close. And in fact, it's harder than ever to raise VC money. So what does that tell you? I don't know. But with the environment the way it is, with interest rates as high as they are, uh, I don't know. I don't see I don't see anything easing up with the VC landscape right now with respect to raising capital. But that being said, you know, whatever you need to raise capital for, I have 10 questions that you should consider before you raise that capital. So let's talk about it. First question, should you raise capital today? Right now, that's a very, very legit question. Like I just mentioned, the landscape in the VC right now is not what it used to be. You know, maybe two years ago, uh, three years ago, investors was just throwing money left and right, you know, and it was very, very easy for you to raise capital with whatever that you needed to do. You have a solid business plan, you can get the money. You have a hot deal, you can get the money. Especially about two years ago, um, the independent fundless sponsor model, you know, it was not that known. So you had a lot of guys that were entering the uh, VC landscape, the PE landscape, looking to raise capital, and they were finding some success. But with the way that rates are higher than ever, Jerome Powell, he doesn't seem like he's going to decrease them, although I think interest rates will decline in 2024. But that being said, you know, is this the right environment to raise capital? And if you are thinking about raising it, I have a couple you know, ways that I want to talk about with you. And one of them, ideally, is bootstrap. Right. So that's one. Should you raise capital today? One. The second question you should ask is if you are not able to raise the capital, how would you pull it off? Let's say it's a business that you have. You have a business idea. OK. And you don't really have a lot of traction. But if you was not able to raise the capital that you need, let's say you need one hundred thousand, five hundred thousand or even a million dollars. What would happen if you don't get that uh, VC money or you don't get that loan? Would the business survive? Would it thrive? Would it go under? Because I can tell you one thing, when you are you know, talking to these capital players, these VC guys, these PE guys, it's a lot more attractive if you're able to say, hey, look, I know I need a million dollars. This is what we're going to do with it. But if I don't have this money, it's not going to it's not going to break my business. I'm going to continue to operate. I have a way to get other money this way and that way. So if you position yourself like that, you're you are in a position where the business is not going to go under, it's not going to com completely collapse because you're not able to raise this capital, investors will be a lot more interested in you and putting money into your pocket. Now, the third, the use of funds. How will the money be used? And I can tell you, I can't tell you how many times that I've talked to entrepreneurs and one thing that they don't have clear is how the funds are going to be used. I can tell you from a banking perspective, when it comes to getting money from the banks in your business plan, this is one of the things that they actually look for above all else. How are the funds going to be used? What are you, how are you going to utilize them? Also, do you have a detailed breakdown enough to where it, it kind of explains in a, in a grand scale, right, very, very detailed, what are you doing? How are those funds going to be utilized? So I want to talk, um, you know, that's another question. Um, what's your ideal investor look like? Who is he? In the stage of your business, is it a investor that, you know, do you need smart money? Do you need somebody who is very high level, institutional, very complicated, sophisticated investor? Or do you need at the stage that you're in, is it more of a partner? Do you need more of a partnership? Do you need an investor that is going to be able to have a little bit more time to kind of check on and see what's going on and be a little bit more intimate in the business with you? Right. So who's your investor? Who's your ideal investor? And who are you looking for? Because the thing is, like, what kind kind of uh, resources are you looking for for that investor to have? I like to tell investors, hey, look, the money is just not it. I'm looking for, you know, something beyond uh, the money, looking for somebody who have way beyond that, who can have connections, um, introductions, get me into other places that is going to set the company up to grow even bigger than where it is right now. Okay, right? And is it a relationship that you want? Are you looking for someone who maybe could get you into a particular club? Maybe you're like, you have a tech background, you want to get into Silicon Valley, right? And that investor is your way to get in there and you want to get introduced to somebody else. So who's your investor and what does that investor look like? Question five, are you willing to lose con uh, control of your company? What does that mean? 
for example, let's say you're doing a $10 million raise, and for it to be enticing to that investor, you may say, oh, you know what, I'm going to give up 52% uh, control of the company. That means you're giving the investor 52% ownership in the company that you own. And maybe you have some kind of you know, clause on the back end to where you say, hey, you're, okay, it's going to be 50%, but I'd like to have the option to buy 20% of these shares you know, at a later date. And you have to negotiate that with the investor, obviously. But are you willing to go lose control of the company and then go big, raise the big money? Or are you going to play it a little bit more safe and kind of keep more control you know, within yourself and maybe you know, utilize some kind of other uh, means of getting that capital? Maybe you want to go uh, utilize some debt instead of the equity. Because the thing is, don't think for a second when these investors write you a big check, $1 million, $5 million, $10 million, that they're not going to be on top of your ass, right? Don't think for a second you're just going to get the money and, oh, okay, I have the money. It's all said and done. I'm on my way. I can live this lifestyle. That's not what that is. You're going to have people, because typically when someone gives you money, it comes with certain rules, right? Certain expectations. So when you get that money from them, you have to be able to, you know, kind of uh, be someone who's coachable, right? Who's teachable so these investors could work with. And you, you have to put your ego aside and be able to kind of be a team player, not, a, not, a, not only a leader, but a team player. So keep that in mind, right? Are you willing to lose control for the company and go big? Are you someone who can take accountability? What does that mean? It kind of ties into point number five I just made, right? Are you willing to go big or go home? And uh, account are you able to take accountability or orders from others? Like I said, when someone gives you money, rather it's the bank, the bank sometimes could be a little bit, bit more stricter than the investor. Keep that in mind. Sometimes the investor, depending on what kind of investor it is, you may have to do, you know, don't have to do the every week or every two weeks reporting. You may get away with the monthly. But are you someone who could take accountability and take orders? You know what I mean? So if you are, let's say you have a acquisition that you're looking to close on and you're running short on that deadline and you're about to miss it. Who's the leader? Ultimately, you're the one who's leading these, this entire thing. It's your company. So you can't place blame on your director or your executive or this person or that person. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, the buck stops at you, and you have to be someone who can take that accountability to say, you know what, guys? I kind of screwed up in this area, right? I had a gut feeling about this. I should have acted a little bit quicker, but I didn't. That's on me. That's my fault. And again, you have to be able to take orders, and you, you have to be willing to listen, you know? Um, don't create friction. Don't create friction when you have a team, especially when you have an investor who's actually putting real money into the company, right? Don't, don't let your ego get in the way. Number seven, right? You have to do due diligence on your industry because once you get in front of the investor, does the, does the investor know more about that industry than you do? Are you getting on the phone with these investors and there are glaring holes in your thesis that you did not address or your team did not address. And that's gonna show investors that you did not do enough research on that industry and you didn't conduct your uh, proper due diligence to be able to sit in front of them and have that discussion. Typically, investors will give you five to maybe you know, 10, 15 minutes. So don't come in front of an investor unprepared, right, ill-prepared. Make sure you do your due diligence and have you done enough um, due diligence to know exactly what you're talking about. Okay. Point number eight, okay? How unique is your idea? Now, we all have ideas, you know what I mean? Um, and idea is only as good as the execution behind that idea, right? And I always say <laughs> the richest people are all in the graveyard because those, that's where those who had world-changing ideas, you know, never came to fru uh, fruition probably because there was not enough execution behind it, whatever the case was, right? Maybe laziness, procrastination, but in the graveyard is the most richest place because there lies all of the all of mankind's greatest ideas never realized i always like to say but so how unique is your idea let me give you an example if you're at the beach and you have an investor who's probably you know in the at his beach house penthouse he's probably you know 20 stories up 10 stories up and he's looking at, down at the beach and everyone has the same kind of umbrella. Let's say everyone has a blue umbrella. How different are you? Is that investor able to look down amongst thousands of umbrellas 
and, but you're the one who stands out for whatever reason, maybe you have a gold umbrella, right? Maybe you have a really, really uh, a umbrella that's maybe five times, ten times the size of these other umbrellas where you, you, know, you just uh, overshadow them. What is it that's making you stick out for that investor to just look in amongst thousands of other idea, business ideas? What is it that's going to make that investor stop and look and be able to identify you amongst those others? So what is your differentiator? And that usually comes in or it's tied into your value proposition to the market a little bit. But how unique is that idea? How different is it? You know, and has you, I mean, have you stress test that against the market? You know, that's very important. Now, number 10, have you done enough math to see what your company is worth? Now, this is extremely important because when you're talking about investors, these are guys, th those are number guys, right? They deal with numbers, uh, numbers all day, valuations all day. So have you done your math and have you done uh, your math properly? Meaning, are you saying that, hey, you know, I, uh, I'm raising 10 million and you don't know what the pre-money valuation for your company is, but you're like, hey, look, I'm, lo I'm raising 10 million and I'm willing to give you 20% or 2% uh, uh, equity in the company. That's not going to make sense. That math is not going to check out, especially for a startup. You know, if you have zero revenue, that's not really going to check out. That's an insane pre-money valuation for that amount. I can tell you that. Uh, because that's not the way valuations work. Uh, with, when, you come, when it comes to valuing companies and when you're getting investor money, it's kind of like this. Let's say you have your company. Your company is worth $4. The investor comes in. He puts in $1. Now you have a company that's worth $5, right? But the thing is, it's worth $5 after the investor gave you that $1. What does that mean? Well, he has a one-on-five play, so he owns 20% of the company, right? That's, that's the way, very, very, very <laughs> elementary terms, way of looking at how investors give you money and the valuation that's tied to that, right? But you want to make sure that you know your math, and the math is actually mathing when you're talking about raising equity and you're giving insane valuations. That's not going to fly, right? Um, now, number 10, are you building to sell and are you building to uh, for long term to create an impact. Reason why you want to ask yourself this is you, you need to know what your exit is. So I'm a real estate guy, commercial real estate you know, background. So when we look at an investment property, the number one thing we have to know is how are we going to exit this property? How are we going to get rid of it? Right. And that's disposition in the company. But we have to know, number one, the first thing is what do how are we going to get rid of this you know, property. How are we going to exit? So your exit plan is something that sh you should know automatically. And you should know if you're building the company to either hold on to it. You might, you know, what does that look like? Okay. Um, building a company could be something like this. You work on it for five years, seven years, or even 10 years. But at the end of it, you know, your exit strategy is to actually uh, go public on the New York Stock Exchange, you know, via uh, IPO. That may be your strategy. So that's you holding on to it. All right. What is built to sell? Well, built to sell. I mean, I'm pretty sure you could understand that. Right. But you built your company up five, seven, ten years, whatever your uh, exit horizon is. You built that up. And when it's when that uh, exit horizon is near, you actually position yourself strategically. So other big players could come and acquire you by by that time. You have a great CEO and CFO. You should be getting offers for the company, right? But building to sell is different. It looks different than, you know, building to actually uh, hold long term. So you have to know exactly what your investor is interested in. Is it an investor who's like, hey, look, you know, I have a long term play. You know, I'm looking at a 25 year investment horizon. You know, this is what I want to do. Or are you looking at the investor who wants to come in and say, you know what? Typically, I like to, you know, have a seven or 10 X on my money within a five year to seven year term. My sweet spot is five years. That's really what I want to, you know, the term I want to invest. Uh, and that's the way I rock. That's that's what does it for me. You know, so you have to know exactly what your exit strategy is. Are you building to sell or are you being positioned on a long-term play, right? So those are just 10 questions I would ask before you raise capital. And next video, we're gonna have six methods of raising capital, right? And I'm also gonna talk about how, well, not only the six methods, but where are these investors and how to get them, right? All right, guys, if you like this video, stay tuned and catch me on the next one.